go ahead and do the go live right now. Sounds good. And uh, the other thing I'm going to do is just grab the link to that. There we go. And I'm going to just post that in Discord. I really feel bad that we didn't see uh, uh, Zach's comment on yesterday's thing. I did. I did send him a private message though. That's good. That's good. So I think we're on page ninety-seven uh, the other thing I'm gonna do of chapter oh, five. Hang on a second. Let me turn that thing off. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just dropping a quick note. Okay. Um, yeah, we should be, in fact, it's the control instructions yep. is exactly where we are. And we're going to, we'll get through these. This is, this is good. We're all fresh. We're happy. We got, you know, decent sleep except for Sam, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had good sleep. I yeah? was waking up like four in the morning. And I was like, oh, oh man, man, I have to be up. So, but it's okay. I'm fine. I'm my sleep schedule's messed up anyway, and, there's, uh, and I don't I don't need to fix it because I don't ever go outside or do anything. <laughs> so it's, like, it's like whatever, right? Daytime, <laughs> right. nighttime, whatever. It's, we're all just nocturnal right now. Right. So. Okay. Let me pull up uh, and get to the right slide. No, I was, I'm glad we waited on this one. I was pretty hammered. We were all pretty beat last night. Needed a little break. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> okay, so there we go. This is where we are. And, 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 we're like 99, and we got to get to like slide 110. So this mm -hmm. is only like 10 or 11 slides, and that's nice. Yeah, shouldn't um, be too bad. Yeah, no, it really shouldn't. Um, okay, let me just get my uh, OBS. Okay, you guys ready? Ready to rock and roll? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, oh man, who else we got? Um, okay, hang on. I gotta figure out. Uh, not everybody's uh, screen name is equally identifiable. Okay, who are you? Identify yourself. It will. It will. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, we're not gonna reveal Will's last name because he's in the witness protection program. And uh, we don't want him to be publicly identifiable. Exactly. So, okay. All right. Just so we all understand each other. Um, hey, Will. Welcome, man. Um, and then the other part one and part two are posted, so you can get to those, you know, for review and double them back. So we're just wrapping up part three right now, and then we'll see if. Uh, oh, I was about to say, see if Vlad joins us. Hey, Vlad. Welcome, man. So. Nice, nice group. This is good. Um, and then just remember, you guys kind of drive the pace a little bit. I'm going to go. I got my pull the string, give a speech. You guys stop me with questions, clarifications, things like that, okay? Um, it's super, super valuable, not just, you know, for you guys, but for everybody. Um, okay, control instructions. So what we have done so far, we talked about three different kinds of instructions, right? We talked about operate instructions, which are kind of just the, the operations, if you will, and in the LC3, that's only add, not, and, uh, and, and. And the second one was data movement. And those are basically the load and store addresses. And when we were talking about load and store and that data movement stuff, we introduced the five um, uh, addressing modes, right? And so all of that is in, you know, part one and part two. This is the third group of, uh, of instructions, which is control instructions. And this is where we actually uh, are able to do things like, you know, the equivalent of an if statement or loop, you know, for loops and, and the ability to kind of make decisions. If you think about it, um, any program that just sort of like does a list of things, sure, that's valuable if you just need a bunch of things done, you know, from start to finish. But the, the real beauty of the computer is the ability to change where the execution flow goes, right? I'm going, and remember the default is you increment the program counter. Now you're at the next one. Increment the program counter. That's the default. And in fact, as we talked about, the program counter gets incremented every single time uh, right after the instruction gets fetched, right? Program counter's here. You go to memory, get that instruction, put it in the instruction register, and you increment the program counter. So you're always pointing ready to go to the next one. 
the, the control instructions come into play when you're like, well, uh, under one condition, I'd like to keep going straight, but if that condition isn't met, I want to kick all the way out and go somewhere else, right? Well, the way that we make those decisions, we already talked about these, is the control codes, right? Every time a value is written to a register, those control codes get set. I've got to have some mechanism that allows me to, to conditionally, you know, move and, and say based on something. And literally everything we do is based on that essentially positive, negative, and equal, or zero, Freudian there, all right? And so essentially we have this notion of conditional branching. And then sometimes there's just unconditional. I, I'm here and I know right here I need to go over there. And that's an unconditional jump, okay? So let's just kind of break those down and then kind of hit these other ones, which is um, we talked about the conditional branch, which is um, in the LC3, that's just called a branch instruction. The unconditional jump, which is called a jump instruction. The subroutine call, which we're going to break down a little bit, and I think that's quite important, okay? And then trap instructions, which we talked about. And I might remind me, okay, if I forget, we might want to like pull up the LC3 and do a little, uh, you know, walk through a little bit more to remind ourselves kind of what the trap routines are kind of doing. And the last one is return from interrupt, which we, we pretty much don't really use um, for a handful of reasons. But, uh, but it's an important idea when you start talking about interrupts. Okay? And I just want to say this too. Whenever we get to trap routines and interrupts, which I think is like chapter 9, 8 or 9, um, I think I do not as much on interrupts as would be nice, but the truth is I think you guys would agree that this class is not sparse in terms of content. We are pounding kind of nonstop, you know what I mean? Especially if you're not familiar with any of this when you start, it's a lot to sort of kind of pack in. So I don't feel too bad um, and you've got to get to it when it's, you know, at some point understanding architectures. Okay, are we ready? Keep rolling. So this is the branch instruction, the, un the conditional branch, okay? So that's our op code right there, all zeros, and that's the name of this thing, BR for branch. Now this part, um, let me just see real quick. Yeah, okay, we got a couple here to kind of illustrate. And we asked last time, somebody asked last time, like, you know, can we see where the NZ, where the control codes are? you know, in terms of like schematic or, you know, and, and this is when we're going to do that. Okay, so here's what we do. The branch instruction, and remember, remember again, let me just say it again. Every instruction is like a tiny little program and th that program kind of, you know, illustrates sort of like a contract with the control unit. That contract is embodied in the state machine that's in the control unit, which says if I get this instruction, I go you know, this is what I, this is how I move through the state machine for that instruction. And what this little instruction says is look at these three bits right here. Now they're called N, Z, and P. And you may recall that the control codes were called N, Z, and P. And this is a little bit of a point of confusion, okay? And you have to separate in your head that there are tangible registers, one bit each, one called N, one called Z, one called P, okay? In the control unit, there are these three registers called NZP, and they get set every time you write to a register. Any, anytime a value is put in a register, they get written. Now in the instruction, in the branch instruction, what happens? is that we have the ability essentially to say with these three bits, which of the control codes do I care about? Which of the control codes am I telling you to be concerned about? Okay? So if I flick, if I turn N on and Z and P are off, I'm saying, hey, don't check Z and P because I don't even care. 
but check the end bit. And if the end bit is on, take the branch. If it's off, don't take the branch. It doesn't matter what ZMP are because I, I put one zero zero here. If I put zero one one, let's say, I'm saying that if the value is positive or zero, in other words, it's non-negative, right? Now, what, do I, what am I saying then? I'm saying, go look at the control codes. Don't even look it in. Don't, even, don't ignore it. I don't even care. But if either Z or P, remember one of the control codes is on and the other two are off. Has to be. The, these three values are mutually exclusive in the control codes where the values get set. That makes sense, right? A number can't be, the number itself can't be both zero and a non-zero positive. Okay, you know, it can't be both positive and negative, right? Um, Makes sense. So the control codes have to be one, but these are um, the, what do we call them? They're just NZP bits. These bits can be all on, all off, or any combination because this just tells you, remember this instruction is the contract and that ends like a little program. And that little program says, if they're all on, it says, hey, look at all three of those control codes. If any one of them is on, take the branch. Well, if I turn these all on, what's going to happen? Does it just create like a, like an unconditional? Yeah. Uh, like jump type Yeah, thing? right. Yeah. No, that's right. Now, the thing is about this is it, it creates an unconditional jump. Because if I say one, 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 guess what? I think one of those is going to be on. It says, hey, look at all three. If any of those three is on, take the, take the branch. Yeah, I think one of the three is going to be on. Okay. Let's flip it the other way. What if I, what if I had zero, zero, zero right here? What's going to happen? It's not going to jump at all. That's right. That's right. It's just going to drop through. Essentially, it turns into what we call a no-op, which is there are actually um, instruction set architectures that have a no-op instruction, and it's always abbreviated or spelled N-O-P, and literally the no-op just, it's like a placeholder. It just sits there, you get to it, you do nothing, and you go and you, and you do the next one. All the no-op does is just occupy a little bit of space and burn a little bit of time. So this is a good metaphor for certain things, right? I, I will sometimes talk about so-and-so employee is just really kind of a no-op. They occupy space and they burn time. They don't actually do anything, right? You could use that. Um, that one has actually entered into my family's um, vernacular, which is kind of funny. Um, okay. So yeah, but because if I say zero, 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 I'm just like, okay, don't look at the N, uh, don't look at the Z and don't look at the P. What do you think? You know, and control unit goes, yeah, I think we're not going to take the branch. And so like, does, yeah. with, if it's all Z or zeros, right. And yeah. you kind of get that no op effect. Does yeah. it, is it like evaluated? Like, um, so it'll be an instruction, I guess it'll be in the IR, right? Instruction register. And then mm -hmm. this will be evaluated. Does it actually, right. um, like it just doesn't, uh, like evaluate it at all, right? No, like it, it well, it executes it. It, it executes oh, it, it does? but the effect is to do nothing. Okay. You know what I mean? It does. It does. Cause what happens is when, when you see the four bit op code for branch, all zeros, that just goes to the that goes to the state machine in the control unit, and just goes, "Hey, here's a BR for you. Boom, go." And then it goes, "All oh, right, I know what to do with a BR." And now it's executing the thing. I'm gonna check that bit. Oh, don't check that bit. Don't check that bit. Don't check that bit. Uh, yeah, I, I'm zero here on my whole condition. Don't take the jump. Done. You know, and then the program counter's been incremented. Grabs the next one, increments program counter, and just keeps going. Um, but when it's going to take the branch, and I honestly, I don't, not, I don't know whether it calculates the offset, uh, the 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 new address 
before checking the NZP bits, but I think the schematic's gonna show us. I just don't remember off the top of my head. But when we are gonna take that branch, the address is a PC offset nine, and we already know how to do the PC offset, right? You take this value as a twos complement integer, which means it could be negative, it could be positive, right? It's twos complement notation. We grab the incremented PC, and it is important to remember again that it is the incremented PC, okay? It has already been incremented. It is, if this is our instruction, the PC is like down the next one, okay? You take this offset, you add it to the PC, and if we take the branch, if, if this thing kind of evaluates, another way to look at this, by the way, and I think you guys can kind of handle this. I don't want to throw too many, you know, explanations in, but think of also, you could think of this as taking this bit and anding it with the control code for N, taking this bit and anding it with the control code for N, taking the P bit and anding it with the control, sorry, for Z, taking the P bit and anding it with the control code for P. You know what I mean? And then kind of like oring those three values together. That is in fact what happens, you know? So if, this, if these are all zero, it's going to evaluate to zero if you think about it. If these are all ones, if you look at it that exact same way, it's going to evaluate to one. And if it's one, we take the branch. So when we take the branch, we take that PC offset, we take the incremented PC, we add those together, and then we put that value. Anybody want to jump in? Where are we putting that value? Program counter. We put it, we put that back into the program counter. So let's just say it was like jump ahead a hundred instructions, right? And it's, it's gonna be wait on there. We take that new value, put it in the program counter. Well, guess what's gonna happen next? We're back to the top of the fetch decode execute cycle. Program counter now points to a different location, pulls from there, and we're just going again. So every time you just change the value in the program counter, which it changes by one every time by, you know, automatically, but anytime you load a new value into the PC for whatever reason, and again, we can't do that as programmers, but the control unit does that by contract, right? We, we made this contract and when it's running in real time and it double checks, it goes, yep, we're supposed to change the PC. It'll grab it, do the add, put that value back, and then just like, okay, I'm done, go again. Fetch, I don't mean like fetch, I mean like fetch the next instruction, go. Well, where's it gonna fetch it from? Whatever the program counter points to. So it's kind of like teleporting, you know? You put a new value in the PC, it can be anywhere in the machine. Boom, you teleported. Cool, right? And that's how you do branches and loops and if statements. And that is literally underneath how every for loop, while loop, uh, switch statement, um, you know what I'm saying? If then else statements, all of those functions are created using these mechanisms. And there's always something like this uh, in, every, in every system in every architecture. Sometimes they, rather than having you explicitly manage control bits or and control codes, they might actually have like a branch greater than, branch greater than or equal, branch not equal. You know what I mean? They'll have a bunch of variants that where the instructions themselves kind of say the logical comparison, you know? Also branch positive, negative, zero, etc. Here though, we have to build that bit of logic ourselves. You know what I mean? Like we talked about, I take two numbers. If I want to know if they're equal or which one's bigger, flashback to the homework, I can negate this one, add them together. If, there's, if that answer is zero, they're the same number. So I can test for equivalence, right? Or is it bigger or smaller? Well, the answer is going to wind up either being positive or negative. So I can then just branch on those conditions and, and create and build the, the rudiments of all that logic. Okay. Um, all right, so this just reiterates what we're doing there. Remember, uh, so in this hypothetical, the last value loaded into a general purpose register was zero, hypothetically. So the zero condition code is one, okay? And the other ones are zero, right? N is zero. Z is one, P is zero. 
And let's just say that the current instruction, the, the current address of the instruction we're running is hex 4027. So the PC is 4028 already, right? Then we take this value, 4028, which is the incremented program counter. This value in uh, this PC offset 9, which is hex 0D9. There it is right there. And we add those together. That gives us 4101. We take that value and we shove it into the PC. So now the PC gets set to that value. So the next fetch is going to pull from 4101. And that, by the way, is should say X. It should say X4101. Okay. Cool. And then here, you've been waiting for it. Here is, I'm going to go over here because it's bigger for me. But, okay, this is the very same thing we just did here. Only now let's look at it with the schematic. Um, there is the program counter. Okay. And um, let's see. Actually, let me back up because the program counter was 40. We were at address 4027. Now it's 4028 because it's already been incremented, right? There's 4028. Cool. Um, we're a branch instruction. We are saying, so here are the N, Z, and P control code registers. We basically take that and the register and we and it together. The Z bit and the register and it together. P bit, register, and them together. Um, so the reality is at most one of these is going to pop out with a one, right? Because one of these bits is one and the other two are zero. And wherever there's zero, the answer is going to be zero. Cool. But here's an or. So you basically say if, if either, if you tell me to look at the end bit and it's on, you know, then the others are going to be zero. But or says, is any one of these on? And, you know, in this case, we say don't look at the end bit because that zero just masks whatever was going to be in there. This P bit of zero is going to mask whatever was over here. Okay? And the answer here is going to be yes. Because we said look at the Z bit and the Z bit was on. So one and one gets you one. And again, if I wasn't such a lazy butt, I would have this animated and a bunch of other examples, because the problem, the problem with this slide, now granted, this was, this was provided by the publisher, but the problem with it is that it goes 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 0, and then you lose the, the cognitive sort of the separation, conceptual separation. You see what I mean? Um, I think you lose a little, so I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to kind of walk through it. But we did say... We're looking for zero. The last instruction written to a register was a zero. I mean, the last value written to a register was a zero. So this guy pops out and goes, yes. So because of that, yes, and that actually winds up, you know, doing some stuff here with the circuitry that's not, I, not uh, included. We grab this PC offset nine, right? We sign extend it to 16 bits, which makes it that which is going to be 0, 0, D9. We take the PC and put that as one operand into the add, and then this as the other operand. So this is the, the ALU, but we're going to do an add instruction. We add those together, and then uh, we are going... This is more options here that we'll just ignore for now, okay? But that, that value is influenced by whether this says make the change or not, okay? And if this thing came out no, then it's over here in this PC multiplexer that it's going to basically say, yeah, I know you just did that addition. Throw it away. Don't worry about it. Um, the the PC is going to stay the same. But since this guy's one, he's going to feed into this multiplexer and say, yeah, I want, I want the, this result of this add to be the thing, and I'm gonna then roll it over and put it into the PC. Whew. Makes sense though, right? Uh, it makes sense to me. 
Anybody else? <laughs> Does that make sense to anyone else? Yep. Okay. So that is how the conditional branch works. Now, what we're going to find out when we get to assembly language is that when we actually write the branch instruction in assembly, we, we identify these, these condition codes or these, these NZP bits by saying usually capital B, capital R, right? So it's like, hang on. So it's like capital B, R, and then kind of like that. So the B, big B, R, and then it can be like, like that would be kind of like BRZ. Now it looks like a subscript. Sorry, that was bad. Um, I don't mean to make it look like a subscript. I'll do this thing. Like that. Going back to my really, really good grade school. That's pretty dang good grade school penmanship, is it not? Or I can go. That's good. You know, like that. Whatever, whatever the combo is of N, Z, N, P, I do it with with characters, with letters, in assembly language. Okay. And then would you just put the PC offset after it? Yep. Yeah, exactly. You'd put um, in assembly. I would probably put a label, which we haven't really gotten to at this stage in the lecture series. Although in class we have. Yep. Um, I'd usually identify a label. And then the assembler is going to calculate that offset. One of the beauties of assembly language is that the loop, you know, the the uh, the symbols like loop or something get put into a symbol table with their address kind of you know mm -hmm. connected to them. Now I can just do a calculation and figure out what the offset is. Because mm -hmm. part of what kills you is your um, you got this program working and then you just realized oh I forgot one instruction right. And then you add the one instruction. You're doing this in machine code. You add the one instruction, and all the offsets are wrong. Right? That's the hassle. The assembler saves you from all that. Because the loop just moves wherever it is, and then it, when you assemble it, and, you know, we get into that whenever, whatever that chapter was. Eight? Seven? I don't know what it was. Probably seven. I don't remember. Anyway, okay. All right, let's keep going. So we're going to do an example here, okay, where we're going to see the NZP bits in operation. So what we're going to do, the, the sample um, exercise is we are going to add integers in memory, okay? So what we're going to do basically is this is the setup. All right, hey, Marcos. Hello. Hey, and then make sure if you got background noise, just make sure and mute your mic in between, okay? I guess we know what the prime time is for uh, for help sections, huh? Or for uh, for repeat lectures. Um, okay. Now this is great. Um, so, all right. So what we're gonna do? We're, we're going to now. This is just a setup. How realistic is this? Whatever. You be the judge. But. We've got 12 consecutive memory locations, and in these locations are integers. That's our setup. We know it's 12. We're not getting fancy here, okay? And we're going to add them up. Cool? That's all we're going to do is add these up. And they are in address locations 3100 to 310B. How, why? How do we know this? This is just the scenario we're given. That's the setup, okay? Um, and that's kind of embodied right here. And we're going to compete the sums, right? So let me, guys, let me throw this at you first of all. Can we do it without looping? What are your thoughts on that? Can we do it without looping? Yeah. How would you do it without looping? You would just like put them all um, in continuous order. And so then you just say like, all right. And then you'd like hard code it. So you just say like, add this register to that. Add this one to that one, add this one to that one, add this one to that one. Yep, exactly. You'd be like, hey, grab the value in 3100. Add it to add it to our little counter. Okay, now grab the value in 3101. You'd hard code it, exactly like Will said. You hard code that thing. Um, 
so yeah, you could do it without looping. But the problem is, um, first of all, we often don't know exactly how many times we're going to do it. That's part of it. So sometimes you need to like, you know, someone's going to, you're going to like find out what the number needs to be like, maybe like the length of a string, right? And the string could be a bunch of different lengths. And so you got to, and they're going to hand you, oh, by the way, the string length is 28. So you got to do this 28 times. Well, hard coding is not generally a really great idea. Besides the fact that there's a thing in uh, software programming that we sometimes call magic numbers. And magic numbers are any situation in which you hard code a number to make something work. It is generally, almost always, a really, really bad idea, okay, to use magic numbers. Um, and uh, for, for a whole bunch of reasons, okay. Um, but 12 here is a magic number. <laughs> it is. Um, it's really bad. And uh, okay, so here's what we're doing. This is the logic. So this is kind of like the little flow chart, if I can find my mouse. This is the flow chart, right? Um, basically, I'm going to put the register, the value of the, uh, sorry, the value of the address into register one. Okay. And I'm going to use, and if, if, for those of you that were on part two, um, you know, what's, if I'm shoving the address of the first thing into a register, what does that kind of hint about what I'm going to probably use, um, later on to, uh, to access memory? Like what addressing mode? This is pop quiz time. Register mode, like address yeah. mode. Yeah, yeah. We called it. Uh, we called it uh, register base plus offset was what we. Well, that was the official name was base plus offset, right? But we had a base register, and the base register held the address. And when we did base plus offset, we went to the address that that register pointed to. Okay. When I see. Oh, hey, let's put this value into a register. I immediately go, yeah, we're going to do base plus offset. I know it. Okay. Which would be like LDR, you know, LD, LDR, STR instructions, kind of load and store with a register. Um, we're going to initialize our three to be our counter, our little, our sum, right? We've got to start that guy with zero. And then our two is going to be our countdown. We'll start it off at 12. We'll decrement it every time. When it gets to zero, we're going to stop. Okay. And then what we do is at the very top, we just kick in and we ask, is R2 zero yet? If he is, we're done. And we just jump around it. If we're not, we go sequential and we go these steps. Okay. And it's important that you understand this at this level. So when we get to the next slide, here's spoiler. Okay. Ready for spoiler. When we get to that one, you know, we've got some sense of what's going on here. What we do then is we go out to memory at the location referenced by R1. We grab the data there and we bring that data into R4. That is one of the integers we're adding up. Okay. We add that value to R3, which is our running total. Right on. Now, decrement R2, easy enough, right? We're decrementing from 12 down to zero. So, but what about increment R1? What, what, what do you think about that? What are we doing with that one? That's the one that's telling us the next number to add to R3. So like, cause it's in order from 3100 to 310 B. So we have to just like go down. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're really doing, we're really doing that. That's right on. Well, what we're doing here is we're like R1 points to that spot in memory where the first, you know, where the current integer is or the first integer. We just want to, if we want to look at the next one, we just increment R1. Now R1 is at 3101. He points to the next one. Now R1 is at 3102, 3103. So, so while we're counting down 12, 11, 10, 9, down to zero, R1 is starting at 3100. Now it's looking at 3101, 02, 3. And R1 is actually being incremented, which, which by using base plus offset, in other words, the LDR instruction, um, we're able to just like march our way through memory, which is fairly cool, right? 
Um, and that's it. And then we just go back. But you, do you see where the branches are? So that question mark, that's decision time. So we got, there's got to be a conditional branch right in here. This is just drop straight through. Don't do anything special. Okay. This is if the condition holds true, we're branching all the way around past all that stuff. And this is one where we're going to do boink, 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 boink. And then we're going to unconditional jump back to the top where we're going to check the condition again. Okay. Everybody got that, right? Now, here's, here's the next question. Uh, does the order of, I got these four things that are happening in this box, right? Does the order of these things matter? And, and if so, why? It's, I'm telegraphing. It does matter. But why? Well, let me throw, let me, let me well, keep, go ahead. Any, any sense about the order of well, these operations in this box? I mean, you have to have R4 be the new uh, number to add to the, like, uh, you gotta, R3, basically. Otherwise, it's, you're not going to be doing anything. That's right, Ryan. You, you, you got to grab the next R4, right? Which also means you got to get that guy first before you add that value into the total. That's kind of a big no-duh. And you've got to be referencing from R1 before you increment R1 to get to the next guy. So it's fairly straightforward why R1 is pointing to the right spot. Grab the memory, put it in R4. I've got to do that very, very first. Okay? And then I can add that value to R3. I've got to get R4 before I can add it. Okay? And then it's clear that incrementing R1 needs to happen sometime after I pull the value out of memory into R4. Right? Because I, I can't be trashing R1 before I use it. I use it, then I increment it. But R2 never gets used in this, right? R2 never shows up in this box. Okay? What happens if I just, you know, did it earlier? Like, let's say the very first thing I did at the top here was I decremented R2. Then I did this. It wouldn't hurt the operation of, of the summing. I'd get the right value out of memory. I'd point to the right spot. I'd increment R1. I'd, I'd adjust the sum appropriately. It wouldn't affect it went, any it of those things. wouldn't change anything, right? Not in this box. So why but would it, it matter? It wouldn't change anything in the whole problem. Yeah, it would. Would it? Yeah. It would. Uh -huh. This is the tricky part. This is the puzzle solve moment. And, and this, is, this is slightly uh, pushing the envelope kind of question because we haven't actually gotten to like show, you know, what the program's gonna look like. But here's the key. This, I'll, I'll, unless anybody wants to jump in and stop me, I'm gonna tell you what the, kind of what the key is. The way, the way that I do, oh, hey, Derek. Hey, Derek, can you mute your mic? Actually, I can mute Derek as well. Yep. Hey, Derek. Oh, Derek's gone. <laughs> All right. But I can I can manually mute from my side if I need to. Um, anyway, here's the deal. How are you doing this? How are you doing this question, like this conditional decision? You're doing it with a branch instruction, okay? And the branch instruction has to look at the NZP bits, okay? And the NZP bits only get set when... When is one of the NZP bits set? When a register is changed, like a destination register. When a register is changed, when a register is written to. Okay, now, the, these, now look at the four instructions in the box here, okay? Does that first one change a value in a register? Yep. Yep. How about the second one? Yep. How about the third one? Yep. Yeah. How about the fourth one? Yep. You, you with me here? So... If I, if I, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm starting R2 at 12 and I'm going to decrement it. When R2 gets to zero, I got to kick out. So this is going to be a branch on zero. Okay. It's going to be a branch on zero, but the last thing done before that branch, well, the last touch to the condition codes, let's put it that way. 
before that branch has to be the decrementing of R2. Does that make sense? If you did something else and you then got to the branch on zero, like you incremented R1, branch on zero, how the, how's that going to end for you? It's not. It's not going to end well. You're just going to keep going, right? Uh, if you did whatever, if you did R1 right after you used it, decremented R2 way at the beginning, and the last thing you did was the sum, which was in R3, right? It's random. If that just happened to be zero, you'd kick out and be done, you know? Wow, I got some thunder booming nearby. All right. I have my window open just because, you know, fresh air. Um, anyway, but you see what I mean? The, the branch, the branch with a condition is dependent upon the last time the control codes got tweaked. Okay. So if you, if you do the thing you wanted to do, and then you do other stuff that trashes the control codes, you just introduced a random function, pseudo random. Okay. That makes sense, right? Yeah, I think so. So in if we were to actually write some, you know, like a binary instruction codes, the uh, the branch uh, instruction would be located like just underneath where this says decrement R2, right? No, it's actually going to be above all this stuff because if it's true... Hey, hold on a second real quick. I had wind picking up and uh, starting to blow files off my desk over there, which was making noise. Okay. Um, and what we'll see in the code is um, the that condition. Um, you've got to you've got to do that kind of like at the top. So you check it, and if the answer is no, in other words, we have not finished our countdown. Then you're like, here's the branch. If the answer is no, I just do the next instruction because I didn't take the branch. But if it was yes, I'm jumping around everything. So it does. And what's at the bottom after I do a branch, it's like do the four things. Now there's an unconditional jump back to here. Go again. Unconditional jump. That makes back sense. There. That makes sense. So you would have like two uh, branches. Yep. branch instructions yep. exactly okay to get that to get that because you got to be able to make a decision about whether to drop in or not but at the bottom you got to get yourself back to the top to, to ask the question again and by the way branches and jumps do not trash the control codes they don't write to registers they don't write to general purpose registers they might cause the control unit to change the change the program counter but that, that doesn't count. It's only the eight general purpose registers that are at issue. Okay? So let's, let's do this thing. Whew. Everybody feeling, uh, everybody had their Wheaties this morning. You ready for this? Um, and by the way, this is not animated. Uh, unlike in the past, we've done some, uh, again, this is Chuck the Lazy Butt, right? That didn't animate this bad boy. But... It would be so good, and I will in the summer for the next generation. It always, this, it always, the materials always get just a little better every semester. Okay, but let's take a look. So this is pseudocode out here to the right. This is the pseudocode notation that the book uses, which is just great. Uh, I like it a ton. You got to understand it, you know, kind of how it does what it does. But these are the machine instructions. Okay. So, and we might need... Mm, where is that thing? Let me just pull up the instructions again so we can do the quick reference like we were doing last time. Um, although I've got to like... i got to stretch it now. Um... Okay, I'm going to try this. <laughs> uh, let's go. Uh, 
that kind of fits. That kind of fits, right? Can you guys see even? You can see that. Kinda, Is that yeah. kind of not great? Not great. It's, uh, it's super small. Yeah. Well, the problem is, okay, hang on, hang on. I got a better idea. I got a better idea. Um, the problem is, it's just, uh, it's just sitting there as a, as a PDF. Um, just a second. I'm just going to make a smaller grab of this thing. Yeah, man, we're rocking in real time here. Hang on. Okay. I don't know if you can hear that little sound effect. Okay. Yeah, so this is this is much uh, much smaller uh, because it's a just a screen grab of that thing. So I don't have the overhead. Um, there we go. It's just, it winds up being a little bigger for us. I think it's a little more visible anyway. Okay, so. You hear the lightning? I don't know if you can hear through my headphones, but I definitely got the lightning. It's awesome, man. Love the rain. Um, Okay, 1110, let's go look for it. I mean, we see right there, which kind of goes, oh, grab the value in 3100 and put it in R1, but it's like, well, what's the instruction, right? 1110 is LEA, okay? Load effective address. Now, if you remember, and then we have, we're not going to double back because we hit all these, okay? But load effective address basically says, it's a PC offset. And remember we said it was an immediate value? LEA says, take the PC, the incremented PC. Now, by the way, the incremented PC is now at 3001, right? That's the current instruction. That's the incremented PC, right? So it takes 3001, and then it takes this value, and it adds that value to the incremented PC, Okay, that value, by the way, is zero FF hex. So we do the math. Three zero zero one plus zero zero FF. Can you do the math in your head? You ought to be able to. Let me put it this way. What's FF? What's zero FF plus one? One zero zero, mm -hmm. or like you know, yeah. zero x one zero zero zero. Yeah. Right. If you got that problem right there, right, zero f f plus one, f plus one, is zero carry the one. F plus one zero carry the one. One plus zero plus zero is one, boom. So, yeah, so in other words, three zero zero one plus zero zero FF. Remember the, that, that the uh, nine bits get sine extended, right? And it's a positive number, because you can see, because that's zero. So you add zero zero FF, you get three one zero zero. Do you see it? You get three one zero zero. Um, yeah, I see it. And so that, and since it's LEA, that's load effective address. It's not a loading data. It doesn't say go out to that location and grab the stuff. It says, I want you to just calculate an address for me. Would you do that? Yes. When you have that address, would you please put that into R1? That's why it's kind of called immediate. Anyway, there's R1. That's it. So now R1 has the value 3100, all right? Um, and if you remember, R1 was going to be, 
Oh, R1 is the pointer to all the locations in memory. R1 is going to be the one moving through the memory. Okay? Then, um, next thing we do is we initialize R3 to be zero. Clean the easiest way to do that. Easy peasy, man. You do an and. That's the and. That's the, that's the source register is three. Destination is three. Immediate value is zero. Well, you and anything with zero, it just blows it all up, right? Everything goes to zeros. So R3 gets cleared. R2 gets cleared. Um, now, R2, there are different ways of getting the value 12 into R2, okay? Number of ways of doing it. But what this one does basically is just says, let's just clear R2 and add 12 to it. What happens if I don't clear R2 right there? Because sometimes you guys, not you guys, but others will do this on exams where they're like just adding a value into a register, but they're not clearing the register before they do that. What happens? What's the result of it? Probably not 12. Well, it's random. That's the problem. If that register happens to be zero, works fine. And then all of a sudden it, it's not zero. And it's not fine. Okay. You know, this is what happens. By the way, when you write, you start to do more programs and you have situations where it's like, especially when you get to like operating systems and things where you're low level and the language and the system are not protecting you. Right. Um, and you've got something that like it works and it works and it works and then it stops working and then it won't work at all. I've done this one. You spend all day fighting this bug. And, and it's because you haven't initialized something, for example. And you're just like, something's in there. You don't clear it. You got to reset things back to, you make no assumptions. You reset everything back to where you want it as a starting point. Then what happens is, I've done this back in my undergrad days. Then you turn off your computer, you go home, you go to bed, you do whatever. And the next morning you get up and you start, and you just turn it on and you're like, well, I might as well just run it again, and it works. And it works for like 10 tries, and then it breaks, and then it never works again. And you didn't do any, you didn't change the code, right? You know, there are things we do that fail to account for um, the fact that other things are running in real systems. Other stuff's moving, trashing, writing to stuff, fiddling with registers, whatever. You have to make no assumptions. So we're going to clear R2, make it zero, which we already know how to do that. And then we're just going to add 12. Cleanest way, right? Remember, I got this immediate value of five bits, right? And that five bits gets me um, from positive, uh, what did we say? From positive 15 to negative 16? Yeah. I think that was right. You know, so I can go up to positive 15. So I can do a 12 immediate right there. I do an add from register two, I put, the, I put the result in register two, and I'm going to add this value, which is 12. Eight plus four is 12. All right, so now I'm set up. R1 has the, the address. Uh, R3 is the counter, and it's zero. R2, well, R, sorry, sorry, sorry. R3 is the sum. It's the running total. And it's zero. And R2 is... Uh, the countdown, and it's 12. We're good, right? By the way, one thing to be aware of when you're doing these loop things is the what we call a one-off problem. We're going to do this thing where it's going to go 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 8, 8, 1, 0, and we're going to branch on 0. You can see it right there, branch on 0. But sometimes if you wrote that same program and said branch on negative you would do it 13 times, not 12. Okay? And so you've just got to be careful about that one-off. You're just one off the boundary. You've got to double-check that. Even if you're doing for loops, you, you know, in, a, in Python, you need to double. That is the classic, classic programming mistake. Everybody does it. It's just a little bit funky and intuitive about, like, I started and I stopped. Starting and stopping is, is just, uh, you know, that's the boundary where you've got to have it exactly right. 
double check it to be confident about that. Okay. Now, at this point, we are at the top of the loop and we do a branch on zero. Now, the last thing we did, now this is also really, really important. Imagine that I, that I did the R2 initialization first and then I just cleared R3 and then I did my branch instruction, branch on zero. What's going to happen? It'll just, it'll take the, take the branch. whatever the branch says yeah. to go. We'll just kick out. So this is what's important. At the bottom down here, we're decrementing R2. Then we do the unconditional branch and then we check the control codes. So the R2 being touched is the critical thing. So R2 has touched the last thing in this chunk down here. And it's also the last thing that's touched when we initialize everything to go. So you've got to have that first condition. You've got to be capable of dropping in the first time and then checking every time as you count down and then know when to stop and kick out. So, and what I'm going to do is if it's zero, if the Z bit is, if the control code, the Z control code is set, I'm going to jump to 300A, which is just the last instruction after these, okay? It's like kick out, just kick out and go around. Um, and then this is our loop when we're in the inside. I basically say, let's, so let's go here and go at 0110. Ba -da -ba -da -bum. Where is it? 0110. You're like, Dr. K, you should have this memorized. No, I shouldn't. Um, 0110, it's a load R. That is a base, see it? Base plus offset. We set it up this way. So the base register, we're going to say that the base register is, look at it again, LDR. There's a destination register, then a base register, then an offset. So there's the LDR instruction. The, the destination register is 4. The uh, base register is 1 and the offset is 0. So we go to register 1, which has 3100 zero, zero in it. We add 0 to it. Easy. That's 3100. Zero, zero. We then go the way LDR works. We then go out to the memory location out there that has that va and grab the value that's there, pull it back, and put that into R4. Okay? So R4 is like the the current integer the value so r1 always points to a location in memory r4 is the contents at that memory okay you got this location in memory contents in memory and then we pull that and put it into r4 r3 is the running total and so we just add r3 and r4 how do we do it there's the add instruction source register one is is register three so there, the bit five is zero, so we're going to do a second register. Source register two is number four. We add those together. The result goes into register three. So we just upgraded. We just updated the uh, the the uh, sum, the total, the running total. This part's easy. These two are both super easy. We increment R one, which now takes three one zero zero and moves it to three one zero one. And right, that's just an add, R1, immediate value, 1, put it in R1. Okay? And then we decrement R2. Add, R2, immediate value, negative 1. Put the value in R2. And then this right here, branch instruction. Notice the NZP bits. It's like, yeah, I think one of those is going to be on. Now, this is the tricky part. Where am I going to? Let's go back and look at the branch instruction again. It's a PC offset 9. And by the way, don't rely on your memory until you are really, really confident. Keep that cheat sheet nearby. You know, keep the instruction set. Look them up. Go through them. Okay, so it's a PC offset 9. Now, when you're at this point running this instruction, the PC has been incremented. The PC is 300A, okay? That's the PC. What's this value? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set this up. Negative six. Okay, all right, so yeah, this value 
is the PC offset nine. It's a negative number. So I know we're gonna be, we're going that way, right? We're gonna go back up because it's a negative number. What is the magnitude of that negative number? Well, we flip all the bits. We can do this in our head, right? Zero, 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 all zeros. We can just ignore because they're leading zeros. One, zero, one. We can look at that and go, that's five, add one, six. Or you can just go one, zero, one, add one in the binary and you get one, one, zero, which is six. So it's negative six. So we're gonna go from right here, okay? We're gonna back up and go one, two, three, four, five, six, and we're basically going back to this branch instruction. That's our absolute jump. And that's the program, or the, the code segment anyway, right? Everybody cool with that? Um, this is like a lot of stuff, but it's all small chunks. You know what I mean? This right here, this master cheat sheet is, this is your ticket. Once you understand what all these things are doing and it's all open book again, I've got that full instruction set thing available to you, right? When you do the exams, um, you just look it up, double check it. And it's like every one of these instructions, remember, is like a... It's like a little program, right? It's like a little program to the control unit to tell the control unit what to do. The documentation of that little program is that full instruction set with every pay, every instruction as its own page. Look it up. It's open book. Life is open book in that respect. It's not always, always open book, open book, but programming for the most part in reality is open book, meaning you get to look stuff up. You don't have to just remember everything. But if you don't know the concept, looking it up isn't going to help you. Okay. Was that kind of cool? And, and what you see is the, um, you know, the back, the, the, the relationship. This is our little flow chart. That is our machine code. Now, you know what I really, really need to do? Again, insert comment about Dr. K is a lazy butt would be just showing this program like right now in assembly language. You that know? would be pretty helpful. We haven't honestly. really introduced assembly language, you know, but we've, introdu you know, we've introduced all these instructions. There's just some syntax that's missing. And then do it again in like C, you know, or Python, or just something high level, you know? So you can kind of just catch that interplay. That's what I really, really should do. That would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Yeah. <sighs> okay. The summer. The mythical summer when all is possible. Okay. So. And we've got like five or six. Um, five or six uh, slides. Yeah, I can hear you, bud. Oh, I had a question. Yeah, Vlad, go. My mic was not working. Sure. Could, could, could you go back to, to the that uh, program? Yeah. Script. One second. Uh, hang on a second. So the first that guy there or branch, that one or this one? This one. Okay. Okay, the first branch, which is at uh, 3004, it throws us uh, six... Um, wait, wait. Sorry, Vlad. Did you mean 300A? Oh, at address 3004. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it, it must be throwing us to hold somewhere be below so we cannot see that, right? Well, yeah. The point of this one, of this branch instruction, is that it's branching when you take the branch, when the answer is yes, meaning we've gotten to zero. It's just saying, well, I'm going to branch to right here. Whatever happens next, it's up to us. We're the programmer. Uh you know, it could be the end of the program in a halt. It could be more stuff to do. You know what I mean? It could be jumping uh, to some routine where we're going to print out a message. It's whatever comes next. The key is that we skip around this stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We skip skip around the second branch and whatever is past that. 
place. Yeah, because it's like right here in this in this flow chart. When we take the yes, we don't know what we're going to do next. I, we don't care at this point. But we're we're stopping. We're out of this stuff. You know. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Cool. And is that was that kind of the core question? Um, yeah. I had a question. Uh, yeah, Doctor K. Could yes, you Sam. Explain the the last address, the the branch instruction for that that one. Where this guy here. Yeah, explain the. I, I didn't quite get understand. Yeah. That a little bit. So this is a branch, right? There's the opcode zero 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 is a, is a branch instruction. The branch instruction always has the three bits NZP, and it looks at those and it says. Okay, if either the N bit is on, or if the Z bit is on, or if the P bit is on, if any of them are on, take the branch. Well, it, they're going to be on, right? One of them is going to be on. So this will always hold true, okay? And then, therefore, the branch I'm going to take is this PC offset. So I take those, this, these nine bits... Sign extend it, add it to the PC offset, and then load that new value into the program counter, which is 3004, which is 300A minus 6, and that results in 3004. I put that in the program counter, and now the next instruction I fetch is this one again. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Um, cool. Cool. All right, I'm going to move on, okay? So what we're going to talk about now is when you do, when you do loop control, um, broadly speaking, there are, you know, so broadly speaking, there's two ways of managing some kind of a loop, right? Now, first of all, terminology time, iteration. You have to know this term, okay? To be a computer science major and a software engineer, you need to know the term iteration. It is a, it is such a massively significant concept in computer science, right? You always do iteration, okay? Um, which really just means, you know, the concept of iteration means to do something over and over and over and over and over again, okay? Um, but also it is a noun, which, well, iteration is also as a noun describing the broad idea. But a single iteration, you can use the term uh, iteration to refer to a given cycle. So on this iteration, during this iteration, in the first iteration, see what I mean? So you can use it to refer to one trip through. You can also use it to refer broadly to the concept, like, you know, and as a verb, iterate. So you're like, okay, we just need to iterate through this list and look at all these things or iterate through all the characters of a string, you know, et cetera, okay? So that's the term iteration. You gotta know that. Um, broadly speaking, two ways of doing that, okay? One is a counter, which we already showed. That's the for, you know, uh, like a for loop where you've got some number, right? For i in some range, if you're doing Python or in a, like a C or C++, you know, I get some, you know, I is kind of an index, and, you know, for I gets one to 20 or some, you know what I mean, there's some number, and that's, that's a counter, okay? The sentinel, uh, as it's sometimes referred, is, is a little different, where the sentinel, you're like, you're like, I'm going to keep going um, until... I see a certain thing, all right? When I get, when I see a certain kind of thing, that's when I'm gonna stop. And I'm not, I'm gonna go until I see that. Now, an example is null terminated strings, okay? In a null terminated string, um, what happens is uh, you've got characters, and this is something you're gonna play with in the large project, but you've got like a location and memory with a character in it. Another location, right next to it, character, 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 right? Could be like capital C, the ASCII value for a capital C, a little H, little U, little C, little K, Chuck. And then to terminate the string, 
you put the numeric value zero as the last character, okay? And I don't mean the ASCII value of the character zero, okay? I'm talking about, if you look in memory, all the bits are zeros, okay? The integer zero. And that is called a null terminated string. And we can do things like, like calculate the length of a string because we know that the, at the end of the string, there's a null value. So I can like pull out the first letter. Oh, it's capital C, increment my counter. Pull out the next, you know, character. How, what is it? It's a little H, can increment my value, right? U, C, K, and then the next thing I get is a zero and it's like, oh, it's a zero, I'm done. And oh, the answer was five. Chuck, five letters. Length of the string, Chuck, five. Okay? And I can count that, but I have to expect, I have to have a sentinel. I have to have something I'm looking for to tell me to stop. Okay? Is that by itself kind of make sense to everybody? And when, and when, when you do something like, um, like a string length in any of these, any higher level languages, but, but like you do like a length of a string in Python, this is what it's doing, you know? It is, I don't know exactly how Python does it, but I'm just saying essentially this is how it's doing it. It's just going through, just going zero, one, two, three, you know, and it's a five and get the zero, I'm done, I count. You know, I'm, I'm counting until I get to a zero. That's how string length works. I don't think there's, I, I'll buy everybody on, uh, everybody on the Discord chat right now, I will buy, what am I, what am I buying? Uh, uh, beverage on the house. Um, if, if they actually did it a different way in Python, like in, I don't even know. Somebody, we can find out, we'll find out. But I can't even imagine doing it a different way. Um, I can sort of imagine. But it depends. If they did it a different way, it would be because they were trying to optimize to some kind of weird performance thing or something, but it wouldn't be like the normal way. Um, okay. When you do a counter, you got to know how many times you're going to do it, right? You know what I mean? Just like, just when you do that with Python, you do like the in range, you know, something in a range of whatever. You, you know how many times you're going to do it. With a sentinel, you don't know how many iterations. You don't know how many times through you're going to do it. Okay, and that's also one of the main reasons when you use a sentinel. Okay, also, um, like here's an example. One of the things I can do, again, let's use Python as an example, since you guys you know had that in 1400. Um, if I'm going to calculate the length of a string, I would use the null terminated character, the zero. The, the numeric zero as my sentinel and I would tally up. Ding, 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 ding. Then later on, let's say I want to uppercase the thing. Now there's also an upper and lower, you know, there are upper built in upper and lower case methods for the for the string object in Python. But I'm saying if you wanted to make your own, then I would set myself up for like uh, you know in a in a range from zero to the string length, right? Minus one. So if it were like a character, if there were five characters, I want to iterate from zero to four to get all five characters, right? And now that's one way I could do that is I could iterate. Once I know the length, I can set up an iteration to do it that many times. When I don't even know that, I have to look for something else that will be my cue for when to stop. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, but that's the idea of a sentinel. Now, here's the other thing I wanted to say. I don't ever remember anybody like in industry using the term sentinel you know you really ought to use a uh, sentinel system there chuck i don't that's never happened in my life iteration constantly constantly that's just a term it's like desk chair window iteration it's very common um and counter is also very common for people to talk about yeah i've just got this counter you know whatever um, count up, count down, accumulator, whatever. But just be aware that I don't see that as a term, but there's a concept that we're trying to illustrate, and that concept is important. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Now, by the way, 
we're going to go again with another program, okay? We're going to do that machine thing again, and we're going to start here with this one. We're going to add integers, only we're going to use a sentinel. Now, I think in the mythical summer, when all things are possible, that I should change this example to do something with strings because I just think it's more natural. You know, I mean, this works. It works fine. But I think strings are a little more natural. Okay? So to keep it simple, we're going to do the same thing we did last time. Right? 3100 gets into R1. The, the, the accumulator aggregator is in R3. R4 is the value that pulls out of R1, you know, the location R1 points to, right? This is all exactly the same. The only thing that's different is this question right here. Is R4 the sentinel? That's the question. If it is, we kick out. If it's not, we keep going. Now, the sentinel in question that we're going to do is negative one. We're basically saying, now it turns out the way this code is written, it's a little bit of a cheat. It really just checks for any negative number, okay? But our sentinel says we're adding a whole bunch of, of positive numbers for whatever reason, that's just our spec. We're adding a bunch of positive numbers. As soon as we get a negative number, we're done. And you can easily imagine, you know, that kind of a situation, right? Where you can just drop, maybe zero is valid, so you don't want to make it zero terminated, but there are no valid negative numbers. So when you see negative one, that's your cue that you're done, right? And I already talked about null terminated strings in C. So then I'm doing the very same thing as I did before, right? Add that value in, increment R1, grab the next value. But here's the difference. Notice what, what is, what's missing, you guys. What do you see that's missing? No decrement. Yeah, there's no from compare by missing. I mean, compared to the other one we did, right? There's no decrement. There's no R two to keep a count, initialize it to twelve, decrement it every time, check to see if that guy gets to zero. Nope. What we're doing now is we're saying, look, the last thing you do is you load up R four. Get that's the data value. And then we're just checking is that value the sentinel. And last thing we do before we drop in, and the last thing we do down here is get R4 out of memory. The rest of this sets up exactly the same, okay? <coughs> okay, now, this is the part where this sentinel is a little bit of a, it's a little cheap, um, but let's just walk through it. And again, you already know this, but we're going load effective address, of 3100 into R1. We already did that last time. R1 now has the, the right address in memory. Uh, we're gonna clear R3. Um, we're going to go out to memory pointed to by R1, which is gonna be a base plus offset. So that's LDR. And we're gonna put that in R4. This is all the same, okay? We, we should have cleared R4 first, right? No, it doesn't matter. Because what happens here in this case, Ryan, is we go out to memory pointed to by R1. So we go out there, we grab whatever's there, and we just put that into R4. It overwrite. We, we overwrite, uh, yeah. I see. That we overwrite sense. everything. And that's true of any load or store. It just trashes whatever was there. Um, if you tried to add a value or and a value into something, then you've got to make sure you know what it is when you start. But loading, nah. Just overwrite it. Um, all right, then, and I'm just going to skip the branch for now. This is where we increment the, 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 the aggregate value. We increment R1 to point to the next location in memory. We grab the data out of that location in memory. And then we do an unconditional branch back up to here. So the only thing that really changed, apart from getting rid of the, the increment, the R2 for a decrement down from 12, is... When we pull a value into R4, we just basically check to see if it was negative. Now, the reason this is cheap is that we said right over here that it's terminated with a negative one. The way this code is written, 
No. That's, it is terminated by any negative number. Now, if you said any negative number is illegal and negative, whatever, you're well behaved and it's going to be a negative number, but it won't, it, it'll be negative one, but it won't be any other negative number. Fine, but you get it right. This is not checking for negative one. That is checking for a negative number. And it just happens to be super chill because it's like load R4. So whatever the data value was, if that value is negative, kick out. You know what I mean? It's kind of cheap. What would be... Now, Now, interestingly, if we did this with a string, it would be equally cheap because we'd, be, we'd basically pull the thing in, you know, whatever. Uppercase the character, lower, do whatever we're going to do. But before we did we'd like we'd like pull the character in and we'd check to see if it was zero. We'd literally branch on zero and we'd get out of there because that value was a zero. And in that scenario That's where you're cheap. checking... In that scenario where you're checking a string, you're not checking the NZP, are you? you you're, you're looking for that null zero character. And that value is all zeros, though. Okay. That so null character is, you'll see it in the ASCII table as null, but its value is zero, zero. So yeah, it is, it so, is, but when we, when we check the condition, right, the sentinel, um, are we checking those three one bit registers like the NZP? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And see the difference here is in this code, when I, when I loaded that value out of memory into R4, if that value happened to be a negative number, then the N bit got set and the Z and the P bit, they're still zero. You get up here, branch on, on negative. So if the N bit got set, when I pulled that value in from memory, you know, then then I'm going to take the branch. If it's not, Makes it's sense. either zero or positive, and I want to keep going. Now, you know what's interesting about this? When you do this with strings, back in the day, uh, you would, you know, do like write code to manipulate strings or whatever. And if you ever happen to like overwrite the null termination on a string, because that's that sentinel, that's what you're going to go until you are told to stop. But if you overwrite and get trashed on the part where it tells you to stop, you just take off. Yeah. You know, you just go. Or you're using a built-in function like a printf or something like that in C. And then you trash the null termination or you're building a string and you do it wrong and you forget to put the zero at the end. It'll just start dumping. It'll basically just start reading memory. And it's going to go reading memory until it randomly encounters a zero somewhere. In the meantime, you're going to get that but I have weird little, weird little, uh, they're like little emojis, the historically ancient emojis, you know, that are in the, that are in the ASCII table, you know, little bell, you know, uh, that's what you're going to see when you just like try to just dump that like to the, to the console. Um, anyway, so this is it, right? Those, so those are your two ways of doing it. It's also kind of a refresher on for loops, right? This is more like a, more like a while loop, right? Like while value uh, greater than or equal to zero, right? Get next value, do whatever. While value, you know, you get back to the loop. While value is greater than or equal to zero. You know, and then when it's negative, you'll kick out. But this is how you write it. This is how you code it. Okay, I'm going. So that's all about branch, branching, uh, iteration, um, countdowns, you know, kind of counter type control structures uh, versus uh, sentinels. Um, now we're going to just kind of wrap up with the last little set of instructions, okay? We are on the downhill slide. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. We're also, has it really been almost an hour and a half? We have been having fun, my friends. Yeah, it has. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's right there, man. Yeah. Okay. Woo. But we're almost done. Okay. Uh, the jump instruction, JMP. Um, here's what you have in a jump instruction. There's the opcode, 
1100. That's just reserved. Okay, those three bits are reserved. Those bits are reserved. They just have to be zero. We don't care. Okay? And then there's a base register. That's it. So you got to somehow get a value into a register, and that value has to be an address. All right? Then you just go jump, and you tell it which base register. Boom. That's it. And you can go anywhere. You can't get back. Well, you can get back, actually. You can get back by, by faking, simulating. No, can you get back? Yeah, there are ways to get back. <laughs> but you have to play tricks to get back. Um, you're Matt Damon. You're stuck, on the, you're stuck on Mars, okay? And are you going to get back? That's the question. Um, okay, but if I want to just transfer control... Oh. So let's take a look at like your, um, your programs, the large programs, right? Do at the end. Um, those large programs, you're running a state machine. I don't really need to do like a subroutine call that I return back from when you're doing a state machine. State machines always move from state to state. You know what I mean? I'm in this state and I'm moving. Even when I go backwards, I'm moving forward. Does that make sense? It's like I'm in state seven. Oh, if it's this, I go to state 12. If it's that, I go to state 19. If it's go to this, I go to state 6. And maybe I just came from state 6. But I'm not, re you know what I mean? I'm not returning back and forth to the same, this is returning back and forth. It's more like I go, I do what I do, and I move to my next state. So it's like I'm in a new world. I go to some new state. Boom, I'm in this new state. I do what I do, and I change my state and go to another state. Every change of state can be a jump instruction, okay? As long as I've got the addresses of those routines accessible so I can put them in a base register, boom, I can jump then to any, um, anywhere in memory, okay? I recommend you play around with that when it's time to do that whole thing. Now, if you did want to get back with a jump instruction, did we do JSR? Oh, we did JSR back then, right? But and JSR, hang on a second. JSR, yeah, JSR is a PC offset anyway, but you can also do a JSRR, which if you notice, look at the look at the jump instruction and the JSRR. Opcodes are different. Also notice JSR and JSRR right here. Um, they have the same opcode. But the difference is this bit is, is like a toggle. When that's on, you use a PC offset. When it's off, you use a base register. When it's off, notice what it looks like. It looks exactly like a jump instruction, format-wise. Okay? But it's a different opcode. So what that... And, and the difference, as we talked about, with JSR... I don't know how deeply we got into this. I think it's a weakness. Um, but with a JSR, you're jumping to a subroutine. And what happens um, is that, uh, where are we? What happens with a JSR is that you, um, hang on a second. I don't want that. With a JSR, before you make the jump, um, the control unit grabs the program counter and puts it into R7. And then when you're in the routine, whatever it is, and you get to the end, you use the RET instruction. You say RET, and what RET does is takes the value in R7, whatever it is, and puts it into um, the program counter. Okay? Okay. So one way, to, one way to grab the program counter is to, you can play around with JSR and RET in order to get access to the program counter and now manipulate it. You can also do that with an LEA as long as you do an LEA um, of the very next instruction, which is the incremented program counter. So you can get to, you can get the current program counter um, and manipulate it.
With an LEA, you could also make it just add negative one, right? And then you would have like the, you wouldn't have to go to the next program counter. Um, let me see with LEA, with LEA, we go PC offset nine. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. When you said add, it threw me. Um, but but yes, when yeah, you do. My bad. No, I, I think it was not inaccurate. It was adding the P. You were talking about the PC offset that got added to the PC. Um, yeah. And then that creates an address that I can store away. Yeah, exactly. The PC is already offset one. And so I can even just go uh, LEA and do the PC offset of none, and it'll give me the incremented PC. Or if I go minus one, it'll give me the, the address of the instruction I was just running, or that I'm currently running. So, right, yeah, these are, there's just different ways of, you know, manipulating all of that. Okay, but I think, nah, I think I must touch JSR and JSR later. And besides, this is chapter five. This is where we're just kind of, you know, introduce these ideas. Okay, trap instruction and case in point. More in chapter nine. So the trap instruction is, this is the opcode, all four ones. That's reserved, has to be zeros. And then this is the trap vector. And we really do go much deeper in, in, in chapter nine. So I'm not going to go deep on the trap instructions right now. But it identifies the service call. Okay. And then, you know what, we don't even talk about RTI, and I don't even care, so I'm not going to go there. But I am going to say this, and this, believe it or not, is our last slide for this part three. Chapter five is a lot of stuff, um, but these are just what the vectors are. Now, now there's this classic mistake that people are making on the, the programming, uh, the, the, the homework and, and exams, which is, look, these are hex numbers, hex 2, 5. So it's going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, that's a hex 2. 0, 1, 0, 1, that's a hex 5. It is not hex 1, 9, which is decimal 25. Okay? These are hex values. And what they basically do is identify which trap routine you're going to run. Cool? Cool? By the way, I've conceptualized, and I'm going to maybe try to build it sometime, again, in the future when I have time. Uh, I was thinking about doing the state machine, but using... I've not noodled my way through what I think is the coolest and most efficient way to actually use this, to do the implement the state machine. Because all the branch instructions are too close by. You really need to be able to, like, jump through, you know, jump through a register. You don't need to do subroutines and returns because you're always moving forward through the program. You're never really coming back. Um, but one approach that I've actually considered is trap vectors, where you just identify, you know, you've got, what is it, 256 trap vectors? So you just identify the state numbers, you know. I don't even know how many states you need, you know, for, the, for that large program, right? You need like A, you need AN, you need AD, you need AND, you need ADD, you need uh, AND return, A ADD return. You know, so you need seven states just for A. And there's always an error state. Um, so I don't even know. It might be like 100 states. But I was thinking about doing something like making the states uh, essentially put the address of the routines into the, the, the vector table down at the bottom. At each of these locations in memory, lo literally at location 0020 is the address of the get C instruction. And then at 21 is the address of the out routine. Okay. Um, if you could, I don't know if this is even kosher or good or dumb or what, but you could put addresses of your own routines, shove them into the vector table. I don't know. I think that would be kind of cool. I want to play around. I don't know if that's the cleanest, coolest way to manage the state machine. 
at distance, you know, because you still got to have, you still got to have those addresses kind of nearby to, to play around. Now, one thing, one thing that you can do, oh, it just occurred to me, um, relative to state machine, that is kind of a go out and return model. Let me draw a real, it's relevant to this trap discussion. So let me, I'm just going to draw a real quick picture, okay? If you guys are interested in this. Um, I just realized that um, when I did my famous keyboard driver um, many, many moons ago, this is kind of the architecture that I took. Um, so basically, I'm going to do it kind of like this. So I've got, I've got what I'm kind of calling the state engine right here. And then I've got various states. Inside those states, they go, they go, do this, do this, do this, and then go, you know, change the state to like three. So like right here would be like, do, 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 do. And when you're done, go to state, you know, go to state three. But what happens is, the first thing that would happen is you you the state engine would make a call to state number one, and there'd be some value, some stored value. You can pass those values in registers. So you could say, you know, that I can, I reserve register whatever. We just pick one. Register six. Register doesn't matter. To be the state the current state, right? You go in there and when he's done doing what he does based on the conditions, under one condition, he's like, oh, I'm going to change the value in, you know, if I, if, in other words, if I'm at like, if I'm in state A and then I get an N, then I want to go to the AN state, right? Well, one approach is I just identify each of those states with a number. I've got to document that. Each state with a number, and then is a little different than the trap vectors, and I'm sorry, it's a little bit off the topic, but it's relevant to what everybody cares about. Um, then what happens is just before number one is done doing what it does, it basically just goes, okay, now put the value, you know, three into R6. Return, ret. Boom, you come back, and now the state engine just basically makes the call based upon the value in R6. Oh, R6 is three, let's call state number three. And then ideally, all of those are addresses um, in memory, like in, it's a jump table. Basically, you have a little state manager and a jump table, okay? Makes sense? That's one approach um, to doing the thing that would in fact be like a, a call and a return. Okay, you could use the trap vector table as a jump table. Uh, it's always cleaner if you're managing your own jump table and you're using that to kind of manage. But then you've got to get all of the addresses of all those routines into your jump table. That's kind of the, that's kind of the, key, the key thing. Okay, once your code is stable you, you know, and you know what everything is going to be, you could do that with a bunch of like dot .fill, just, just hard code all the addresses of all the routines, you could do that. I'm trying to figure out if there's a cool automated way to like bop around, you know what I mean? Not really sure, not really sure. What about with a Sentinel? Eh? What if you, sorry, now I'm, <laughs> I'm brainstorming, can you tell? Because this has been nagging at me because what I did at the end was I just totally just stunk it up um, when I, uh, when I did my implementation, I was never satisfied. Uh, one approach is you just, you use this one, one, zero, one. I don't know. Maybe that's your sentinel. Um, I really don't know what you could use, but what you could do with a sentinel, uh, and I'm going to be done here in a sec, but what you could do with a sentinel is like every bit, everywhere in your program, just in front of an actual state thing you put some kind of like well-known value that doesn't repeat itself. It has to be unique enough that it's never going to repeat outside of a marker. And then literally you could just like run some code that searches through memory and grabs and looks for the sentinels. It goes, ooh, there's one. Okay, 
that's state one. Go to the next one. Find it, that's state two. Find it, that's state three. Or a sentinel followed by a number. So the sentinel would identify, uh, you know, the marker that here we are. But again, it has to be something that can't otherwise occur kind of in nature. I don't know, just thinking. Anyway, that's all I want. That's all I got on that. Anyway, we're done. We're done with part three. What happens after this is counting occurrences of a character, which kicks in in the videos we did in class. Yeah, and I'll just want to say, so um, this example, uh, go back to the next slide real quick. Yeah. This one, examples counting occurrences of a character, that starts um, on the video March 10th. March 10th. 2020 on okay. Dr. K software ruminations, just for anyone. So like that's the next video that would come after this one. In case yeah. the sound is off, that's the next video. And then I, I also had a question on the last slide, the previous one. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the halt trap vector. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Briefly, maybe. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, in fact, let me do that. There's a couple ways I want to do that. Let's, um, boom, boom, boom. Okay. Let me get rid of that and bring this in. Okay. So this is documentation from the book. Okay. Um, and you can see them, you can see all of those here. Ah, come on. You can see them all here. So halt, um, yeah, okay, not super helpful on the description. It halts execution and prints a message on the console. So it is a routine. You do literally like jump to this stuff. When you say trap 25, it does cause control flow to move to that routine. So where, so, and I can pull this up in the LC3, Ryan, if you want, but really that's all it does. It just stops your program because if you don't stop the program, it just keeps going, fetch, decode, execute. You, you know what I mean? It's like, stop doing the fetch, decode, execute on this program is really what that says. Uh, so if you halt something, it stops the program, but how do you like start it back up? Like, can you do that or is it just mm -hmm. done? No. Well, it, the program is done. Uh, let me see. Let me pull up the simulator real quick. Yeah. So here's the simulator and then let me, let me blow this up and expando. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Hang on a second. Hang on. Um, there's a weird thing where when you are, uh, this is just with, I don't know, with OBS, I guess. Yeah, it's OBS. Um, but if you happen to be in full slide mode, uh, it, then it won't, it won't allow like browser window, browser tabs to be over the top of that. It'll allow like PDFs and stuff, but not browser tabs. So I've got to move that down. Anyway, so if I just go here and I just say, um, I want to just put a trap instruction, which is going to be F, right? And I'm going to do trap 25, which is halt, okay? So, right, 1111 is the halt, is the trap instruction. And then 2.5 is uh, the number of the halt instruction, all right? So if I just say run, then it does, first of all, I wind up with the PC all trashed over here, like what, okay? Or where is the PC's uh, FD79, we're here, um, you know, we, and then this message gets printed, halting the processor. And then it's all, you're kind of just like frozen here, right? But what you do is you say, unhalt restarts the machine after a halt instruction. So you go unhalt, 
And then if you reset all the registers, you know, so that's, that's kind of the key. Unhalt and reset the registers. You can also like clear all the registers if you want to just clear them all to zero, but reset does the same thing. Control codes always start at Z as a default. And now you're ready to go again if you want to run it again. And if you want to get, you know, into detail, you can step in it and, and actually see what the code's doing. And it's one of those funky things where it just kind of, I don't even really fully, I mean, there has to be some notion of like a program stops. Otherwise, fetch, decode, execute goes on forever, which doesn't make sense, you know. Reality is if you're sitting there with your laptop on, fetch, decode, execute has never stopped for the machine. If it's on, that's happening. Makes sense. Um, um, so with the, tr uh, the halt, mm -hmm. can, let's say you halt, right? Can you pick up from where you left off or do you have to restart? Everything? On the halt, you have to, uh, the halt, you have to unhalt. Let me just go to the end. So there we are. There's no, I can't continue. I can't do anything because there's no fetch, decode, execute going on. See what I mean? So I have to go unhalt. Now, let me see. If I go unhalt, and now I'm running, the program counter is right there where it stopped. So let's just see what happens. R7 still has a uh, that value. Yeah, I don't even know. Those are, oh, I know what that is. I think the FD... FD7E, FD7F. Let me, see, let me see something. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I, can yeah hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Isn't hold so, uh, saving BC into R7, and whenever you start, uh, basically, whenever you restart LC3, it loads whatever in r7 and starts from that point no yeah what i was just looking at right that's what i was kind of thinking about vlad um because typically you're just done you unhalt you reset the registers and you kind of go again you know but in this case i'm just thinking to myself like what happens like if i load what am i even doing i'm loading uh oh i know what's happening i know what's happening I'm loading R1 from FD7E, which is a saved away location. All right, and see FD7F? That was the old program counter. Uh -huh. So what's, what's up in R7 right now is, is actually trashed. When I first entered, we stored R7 away, saved it in memory. We saved R1, we saved R0 because we were going to trash them. Okay. So when I'm running again, it's like I now reset R7. I pull it back out of memory and now R7 is ready to go. And now when I say ret, I'm right here after the halt. Executing a bunch of no ops. <laughs> nice. For a long time, we'll execute no ops. Actually, let's run it. You know what's going to happen? It's going to run till it gets to the end of memory and hits the halt instruction again. Any bets? Boom, I'm a prophet, look at me. Because I already know that there's like nothing in memory. Um, you know, see all the no ops? It's just nothing but no ops all the way till you get to this guy and then he's gonna stop again. Okay, thanks Ryan for inspiring Inspiring yeah. that now I can unhalt and I can go again. So, uh, unhalt, so you can yeah. pick up from where you left off. Apparently, just to yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. The thing that I don't honestly know, truly, that I I've never really gone deeply through this halt, uh, this this code, for the halt instruction. Um, 
because you know we're storing it we load effective address for this fd80 which by the way is the message i'm pretty sure fd80 right see look at these that's ascii space dash 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 space and if you look at those that's going to be capital a little sorry capital h little a see it these are just the ascii values of the string that says all the dashes halting the processor. Let's just keep going. Every, every 0020 is a space. And then eventually we're going to get back. There we go. Here come the dashes. 2D, D345, five dashes, a space, and wait for it. Oh, that's, an, and that's a return. That's a new line. And then what happens? Null terminated. That's the, the, that's the zero at the end of the string. That A causes it to move to a new line instead of just stopping right there. And then there's the zero. So that's a string. And by the way, if anybody's like watching this and, and you're like, is there going to be more stuff that's going to be on the exam? The answer is no. We're just having fun. And tag along if you want or bail out and that's all good. Uh, but okay, so... What happens here is the, this LEA takes the address of the string and puts it in R0. That's what put us wants, okay? Put us expects the address of a null terminated string in R0. So that goes, um, in fact, here, check this out, check this out. Let's do something fun. Um, what's the, let me see, F, G, H, boom, boom, boom. Okay, check this out. I'm changing that. Okay, now I'm just gonna unhalt and I'm gonna run again, faulting the processor. Yeah, baby, I just changed the message now in the system. I'll have to like reload the page because <laughs> I, just, I just put that in memory. Okay, all right, everyone's cool with that, right? So, um, Anyway, so there's the put S. Now we load, okay, now we load R1 from FD A5. Which is data that happens after the string. Okay, that's FFFE. Um... Okay, so I just load. Anyway, and we may not actually get, you know, an understanding of like what the crap, because I really don't know. There may be some like underlying stuff that I've not really explored yet on the LC3. But basically, I'm loading indirect from FDA5, which is FFF something. And so I've got to go into FDA5, I find that address, I go out to that location. Okay, here, check this out. So FDA5, there's FDA5, which is FFFE. So we go to FFFE. Which is that guy, and I store that value. 7 FFF. And then I'm going to um, FD79 to go back to where I was. And I put that value into R1. Okay. So what I'm going to actually do, I'm going to unhalt and I'm going to go, I'm going to go back. Okay, no, you know what I need to do? I'm going to go run again, and then I'm going to set a breakpoint right here. And then I'm going to unhalt, I'm going to run again. Okay, we get to right here. Um, and then I store away F7, R7, I store away R1, R0. I load the thing, I'm going to do a next, which 
which basically skips past the string, faulting the processor. Then I do this load indirect from FDA5 and R1 gets FFFF. I thought it was seven, I thought it was different. Anyway, and then FDA6 gets put in, oh, there's the seven FFF. Okay, so I don't know what this is doing, okay? Because I have not been this deep. Then we take R0 and R1, we and it together, and we put the result into R0. R1's all one, so that everything's gonna survive. Then I take the value in R0, and I store it indirect back out to FDA5. Why, why? Why? I don't know. I don't know. I got to go back to the book probably and maybe just give it a deeper read. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's just like purely random or stupid. You know, I have too much respect for what these guys did on this thing. Um, oh, when I do that, that's the halt halt. Storing that value into FDA5, storing indirect through FDA5. Okay, I'm gonna make a guess. And honestly, you guys are on this journey with me. Storing indirect, which means I gotta go location FFFE. Right there, seven FFF. So I'm gonna bet you some cash bones that if we get into the documentation of the interrupts and the low level system stuff, because there's almost nothing in this memory, you know what I mean? This memory is devoid of, of stuff. But I'll bet that this is a memory mapped IO with a controller for um, halting the processor. Like a low level control to the control unit. That's my bet. Anybody want to bet me? You guys still with me? <laughs> no, but I'm on a, a I'm on a journey, man. I'm on a mission. Uh, okay, who who had a question? I do. Uh, so, as far as I can understand. Boom! Wait! 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 Stop! 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 Right here, there it is. It's right there in the device register assignments. Memory map, I was right. You guys all owe me money. So in location FFFE, it is the machine control register. Also, known, we never even talked about this. I've never even, I'm sure I must have read this, but I don't remember it. Bit 15, remember zero to 15, the leftmost bit is the clock enable bit. When cleared, Instruction processing stops. Okay, now watch this. Sorry, I'm gonna get back to you, Vlad. See how we're all halted? Now watch this. Watch the Majike. I'm turning that guy into all Fs. Now watch up there. I feel. Come on, man. Well, this depends on how on how smart the simulator is, because Having just cleared that, I should be good to go. But let me try this now. I'm going to do one last thing. I'm alive here. And that guy says green light go. And I'm going to just manually change it. And now I'm just going to go like step. And see how everything stopped? I, I manually changed it. And then I said kind of step. And everybody went, whoa, 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 we can't do anything. So it's like the control unit is all bound to that, to that one bit. And when you turn it off, you stop everything. <laughs> Boom. Okay, I know that's not that exciting for you guys, but that has nagged me for a long time. And I just never have taken the time to, to, to do it. Okay, go ahead, Vlad. Yeah, we're just not following it. <laughs> go back. You can go back and look again. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> 
I didn't mean to like leave you guys like, hey, everybody, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'll see you guys all at the end. Sorry, sorry, did not mean to leave everybody in the dust. You're all like pedaling, you're pedaling on your bikes. You're like, come on, Dr. K, stop it, man. Okay, so okay. I, have a, I have a question about, so Trap and JSR and JSRR yeah. uh, save uh, PC into R7, all yep. these three instructions. Yeah, they do. And, okay, Trap jumps us to routine, right? Yeah, it takes, uh, it takes the hex value in the Trap instruction yeah. Goes to that location in memory, pulls that Reserve address routine. out, and then yeah. goes to that routine to execute. Yeah. Yep. And JSR and JSRR do the same, but with the subroutines. Yep. Yep. Okay, what's the difference between uh, routine and subroutine, except for routines are kind of pre-existing and subroutines nah, you have to write no, yourself? Those terms are completely just kind of interchangeable. Um, oh. A routine is, I think, conceptually, a routine in computer science or in software is kind of like any chunk of code that is modular and you can call it and you can get back from it. That's a routine. A subroutine is a routine. It, it, the terms are like, historical. They used to write things back in the 50s and 60s and they would call them uh you know this is I don't know they would just call them subroutines because it was like you'd write this routine that you could like load the routine and blah, 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 blah. but it was like hey well, I can build this little chunk of code over here that everybody can call and come back from another guy calls it and comes back from it and we'll call that a little subroutine Today, modern, the in my view, the differentiation is is irrelevant, and doesn't really even, you know, I'm going to call this routine, or I'm going to call this. I would say routine is more of a modern term, and people don't usually use the word subroutine, outside of assembly language, where JSR stands for jump subroutine, or there's other languages that have things like go sub, and it's a subroutine. You know what I mean? It's, okay, and yeah. the register seven, we should always try to avoid uh, overwriting that or doing anything to register seven. That's going to well, be a good. It depends game. on if you need it. Like if you're using register seven, now all the trap instructions, notice that even over here, um, I'm not trying to just get you back to the simulator, but I, they store away R7. And then they restore R7. So they are, all the trap routines take R7, store it away in a memory location. And when they're yeah. done, they, they load it back so that they preserve R7. What I'm saying, for but, example, but, if in that but routine, it does get trashed. I overwritten R7. Right. What you're saying is you make a jump subroutine and it overwrites whatever you have in R7. So you have to manage that and either just avoid it or save it away before you make a call to a to a, a trap routine or whatever but you have to be careful about it and then you can do back. things like save it you know save it and get it back okay okay um how are we doing are we done we better be done <laughs> dr k i have a question yeah marcos so this is kind of ahead, I guess. It's not really quite chapter five. It's chapter seven. Uh, okay. It's asking us to create a symbol table. Um, yeah. I don't know if I've missed that or. Um, yeah, why don't we, what I think we ought to do is let's, I'm going to stop the, the YouTube live, yeah. you know, from a topic of, we can just stay on the chat, yeah. you know? And um, so let me just 